from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 15th anniversary of the Library of Congress annual National Book Festival. My name is Sandra Smith, and I am an employee at the Library of Congress. I've been there 41 years and nine months. Yay! <laughs> Currently, I work in the Office of Workforce Performance and Development. We are a training and career development office. It is my honor today to introduce the Library of Congress poster illustrator, Mr. Peter DeSev. His illustrations and character designs are known throughout the world. His richly colored, meticulously detailed, and bitingly funny images display an intense beauty and sense of mystery. His work spans three decades in over media, including magazines, books, prints, television, and animated feature films. Best recognized for his many New Yorker covers and his character designs and for the three blockbusters of the Ice Age movies. Peter has also contributed to such films as Mulan, Bug's Life, Tarzan, and Finding Nemo. His many distinctions include the prestigious Hamilton King Award from the Society of Illustrators, a Clio Award for a Nike television commercial, and a Visual Effects Society Award nomination for Outstanding Animated Character Design for Ice Age, Dawn of the Dinosaurs. Peter received his BFA graphic design in 1980. In the early 1990s, he began a career in the movies when a D Disney executive asked him to work on The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Peter currently lives in Brooklyn, New York, with his wife, Randall, and their two daughters, Pauline and Fia. Everyone, please help me welcome to the stage Mr. Peter DeSeth. Uh, hello, everybody. Good morning. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, thank you, Library of Congress, for inviting me to talk about my work I, and, uh, and for inviting me to do the poster, which is a great honor. I, um, I've uh, enjoyed this trip quite a bit. It took me a while to get here, but um, I'm very happy to be here. So thank you for coming. Um, I am going to give you kind of a brief overview of my work in, uh, in print and in animation. And uh, uh, I was going to show you a few video clips, but I think only a couple survived the transfer. So I'll just describe them in horrible detail. Um, <clears throat> uh, and then uh, I'll wind it up and talk a little bit about how I uh, did the poster itself. So without further ado, and let's see if I this works. I thought I would begin with some early work. <laughs> um, this is no doubt the older surviving piece of artwork of mine in existence. I found it uh, when my mother passed away. I found it squirreled away in, in some of her belongings. And what struck me about it was how, even though I was, I don't know how old I was when I did this, maybe seven years old, but it struck me how so much me it is. If you if you look, um, if I, oh yeah, is, is the no nope, that's wrong. Well, if you could see in the car above the car, it says two people in car, and then floating um, above the sharks is a little fedora with a um, with a feather in it. I thought that's me. Um, anyway, I uh, I uh, did a lot of work. Uh, for my portfolio in Parsons uh, in high school during classes when I should have been doing something else. Pretty much my whole portfolio were drawings on line paper like this in ballpoint pen. Uh, my influences when I was young were, a, a, a lot of them were the Warner Brothers cartoons. I, I was not really crazy about Disney. I, 
I never really got Mickey Mouse. I mean, if you think about it, who is he? I mean, he's just kind of a smiling guy. But Bugs Bunny was a full-fledged character with a point of view, and he was sarcastic and clever. Um, he was my hero. I loved him. And uh, he really, the, the Warner Brothers sensibility and sense of humor, I think, uh, affected me more than I realized. I also loved comics. This comic was uh, sort of before my time. It's the EC comics from the 50s, but on the cover is, uh, is a guy named Frank Frazetta, who I discovered when I was about 12 or 13, and just loved the way he drew. Um, uh, he still remains one of my heroes. This, in fact, is a piece of artwork of his that I own. It's, uh, it's kind of incredible because it's a rough for a finished piece, and it's about this big. It's tiny. But I always admired his dynamic draftsmanship and his sense of exaggeration uh, here, too. I thought I was going to be a comic artist. I thought I was going to draw for Spider-Man. That was my plan anyway. But I also loved this gothic horror kind of thing. And uh, there were comic books out at the same time called Swamp Thing, illustrated by a guy named Bernie Wrightson. And in a way, the two in combination uh, really described what I was into when I was uh, about 12 or 13. I, uh, I soon discovered other artists like Heinrich Clay and A.B. Frost, who were great exaggerators. They were somewhere between uh, cartooning and, and realism. And that kind of a, a blend, I think, uh, is really how I would describe my work and the stuff that I was gravitating towards. This book was called Phantasmagoria, and it was uh, illustrated by A.B. Frost. It was written by Lewis Carroll, and I found it in our little library at our house. My great-grandfather was an antiquarian book dealer. And to discover something like this, this little treasure in there, um, with drawings that I could really relate to that were 100 years old, that was, that was an eye-opener for me. It made me look further back beyond what was uh, being published at the time, and it made me realize that there's just so much, so much fantastic work to be inspired by um, in, uh, in the history of art and illustration. This is a guy named Arthur Rackham, another one of the great exaggerators, perfect combination of, I mean, you can see how beautifully um, defined that the female figure is, but, um, and it's possible that he might even have had a model for that, but I'm pretty sure he didn't have a model for the goblins. Um, but it's the fact that he could do this picture and have them exist so perfectly together, that became my, my goal without even realizing it. That was a weird dissolve. I didn't program that in. That was strange. Let's see that again. Oh. <laughs> I would never have chosen that. Um, this is Honoré Daumier, uh, great uh, political illustrator from the uh, late 19th century. And this is myself again. This is college. Uh, I went to Parsons School of Design. And um, this is an example of one of my first assignments there, which was to do an emotional self-portrait. Um, it didn't look like me, but it certainly felt like me. And there's the, 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 uh, the artist's bane, the blank piece of paper at his feet. And also, that's what telephones looked like when I was in college. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Anyway, um, this is a piece I did uh, at Parsons, something like 1978, I think, uh, a paleontology convention. And uh, after school, I did lots of magazine work, um, uh, editorial work, they call it. and. Uh, it was just as the personal computer was becoming a thing, and so there were a million magazines devoted to that subject and uh, with lots of boring articles, I think, so they were desperate for illustration. So it was kind of a good time to be starting out as an illustrator. Unfortunately, it meant drawing lots of businessmen, lots of computers. As you can see um, by the computer there, I, I was really quite gifted at drawing computers that look like marshmallows. Uh, 
businessmen, businessmen, businessmen. I did, I've done a million of them. So I had to sort of find a way into that that uh, was more interesting to me. And I, I think I started to realize that I could have, I could go, um, I could explore costume and exaggeration a lot more. Um, and uh, often used uh, 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 metaphors and fairy tales and myths in order as metaphor to, uh, to solve a problem, uh, an editorial problem. Uh, here is, uh, this was an illustration for Entertainment Weekly um, for when they were, they were actually discussing producing Batman the Musical. And this is when that was a really silly idea. Um, I did lots of book covers. And as you can see from the previous slide and from this one, um, I was able to, I've really enjoyed being able to do a, 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 a large variety of, of work that, that, uh, that reaches back to the things that I loved when I was a kid. So there's this definite, obvious continuum uh, when you look at my early stuff and my present day stuff. Uh, in fact, it's almost embarrassing. Uh, this was an illustration for a forgotten Mark Twain manuscript called A Murder, A Marriage, and a Mystery. Or A Marriage, A Murder, and a Mystery. I don't know which one, but um, it, it had gone unpublished until Norton decided to publish it, and they invited me to do the illustrations. Kind of an amazing thing, but after reading it, I realized there was a good reason it was unpublished. It's a terrible story. Um, uh, some, some of the drawings I do are, are just sketches. They don't really mean anything. They are, um, they are, you know, I'll start with an eyeball and then they grow and they become something else. I sort of hallucinate on paper and then something hopefully shows up. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, sketches, it's very important to always have a sketchbook with you. Um, I tell you this uh, because it's true, but I don't often carry a, sketch, a sketchbook with me. But um, uh, when I do, I draw in the, um, in the subway, and it's a, I live, by the way, in, uh, in Brooklyn, New York. And there is nothing like the, the parade, the variety of characters and costume in any given subway train. I mean, every time the doors open, I put my head in my hands and I wish, oh my God, I wish I could draw that person. Um, this is another sketch that wasn't for anything. It's called Jabba the Husband. <laughs> and, uh, and this was for, um, for there was a, uh, I was invited to contribute to a book of um, Star Wars art. And I was not a big Star Wars fan. I was a Star Trek fan. But uh, this was a big hardcover that uh, they asked people outside of the Star Wars world uh, to give their own interpretations of, of a moment or those characters. Um, and this one is called uh, Easy Being Green, It Is Not. <laughs> and I knew I had a good idea, I have to say, I knew I had a good idea when I realized that not only are they both green, but they're both Muppets, really. And they, they, they essentially come out of the, uh, the Jim Henson studio. So. Uh, George Lucas bought this, by the way. Um, this is, uh, I did a few posters for, for Broadway shows. This is uh, obviously for a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. And this for Noises Off. And uh, most recently, I was asked to uh, do this poster for Something Rotten, which is basically a farcical um, musical comedy in the vein of, it's as if a uh, funny thing happened on the way to the forum meets Shakespeare in Love. And uh, it is incredible how much usage they've gotten out of this poster. They use it in the subway. They use it in Times Square, on the theater, on the marquee, in the subway, on buses. It's, it's really kind of incredible. And it's a very funny show, actually. Go see it. 
I've done a bunch of New Yorker covers. Uh, this is um, one of the first derrieres ever to appear on the New Yorker. I, I carry that distinction. Uh, it's called Beach Bum. Thank you. Um, a little bit to uh, look at the process. Um, this, I was having a conversation with the art director, Francoise Mouly, and she said, uh, you know, sometimes we'll decide on a topic, and, and then I'll present sketches. And she said, maybe something about fur. So I thought, here's this fur-cloaked woman, and she's walking her dog, and all these furry animals are lying in wait with clubs, <laughs> ready to do her harm. But ideas develop, and you, 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 you boil them down, and you start to throw things out. And, uh, and so I got closer, and then finally ended up with this. <laughs> it's called Tailed. This is uh, Summer Getaway. And you know, here's the incredible thing. When you do a cover for The New Yorker, you gotta be really careful. You gotta be careful about, I mean, I took pictures of the house. I, I actually, those people are me and my friends. I even looked at pictures of lobsters. And I thought, okay, I got this one. I'm not gonna get any mail on this one. And then I got a letter. I got a few, actually. Um, and somebody wrote, I know why the lobsters are running away. That barbarian is drinking red wine, not what. <laughs> this is called A New Leaf. I find my covers are becoming more and more Brooklyn-centric. Um, that's a health food place near me. Uh, this is called uh, Hip Hops. <laughs> spectacular river view. <laughs> and this came about because this is a truth and I try to have my covers, you know, have some kind of truth that you recognize as a New Yorker. And um, this one, I was visiting my brother in his new apartment and he opened the window, he was on the 15th floor, he opened the window and he leaned out precariously and he said, Pete, come here. And he said, and we looked down a sliver of buildings and he said, nice view, huh? Anyway, um, this one was uh, this was a tough one because this was done uh, right after 9/11, uh, and uh, obviously, I mean, everybody's every, everybody's gyro was broken with it. Nobody, I, I I remember that day. You could see the smoke coming over from the city. You could actually see the towers, and I remember thinking, "What? Everything changes now. I, I, how do you even do a funny?" cartoon, how does somebody like me make a picture? Um, when will there be, be the right time for that? But anyway, um, this did occur to me uh, as, a, as a Halloween cover, uh, which came out about a month after. Um, it's called Local Heroes. And um, that little girl with the number one helmet holding the pumpkin was, uh, is my daughter, Paulina. You'll see more of her later. Um, and she was only a, she was an infant when I drew this, but I predicted that's what she would look like, and she did. <laughs> New Yorkers take things very seriously. <laughs> Easter egg. Uh, I know, that's Darla, Darla Poodle. We call her Darla Poodle because she didn't know she was a pit bull. She's the <laughs> sweetest animal in the world and, uh, and a living, breathing cartoon. And she, she was in a lot of my pictures. There are a couple here. Uh, you can see under the Democrat, uh, donkey's arm, it's Darla. This one is called By a Nose. We shall not speak of it again. Um, this is me at my coffee shop. If you go up the street, that's my house. Um, and that's Darla. And the, the title is Stay.
This is Henry Biscuit. He is our new dog, although we, now we've had him for about five years. I still think of him as our new dog. He's, he's, he's wonderful, but he's an idiot. Uh, he made it on the cover. This is called Tag Sale. Um, this was part of a few drawings uh, that, that uh, are not going, you're not going to see because I forgot to put the other ones in. Um, crocodile Tears. This was a rejected cover, by the way. That happens a lot. I don't usually go to finish, but I like this idea, so I did. Uh, this was also rejected. It's called Something Familiar. I thought it was sweet. There's a kitten. A lot of kittens. Let's move on. And this is uh, a book called The Duchess of Whimsy. It's a children's book that my beautiful wife, Randall, wrote that ended up being, uh, without our realizing it, kind of a family album. My, my father-in-law makes an appearance. That looks a little bit like my wife, my dog, my two children. They all show up. Uh, it's called The Duchess of Whimsy, and it's about two people, this, uh, this, this whimsical duchess who has no time for the ordinary, and this very ordinary man, the Duke of Norm, who, uh, the Earl of Norm, uh, who is in love with her, and he can't seem to get her attention. You'll have to read the book to find out what happens. Uh, this is uh, a video that I illustrated um, with about 150 watercolors. It's called Finn McCool, and uh, based on this, a, um, a producer from Disney saw it and asked me if I would like to do drawings, character designs for The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And this was my first animation gig and I've been doing it ever since. I worked on Finding Nemo. Which is really fun. It's a great movie, one of my very favorites. And sometimes with a, a character I'll sort of take it through a house of mirrors and just stretch it and pull it and push it until something, something happens. So uh, I also do, occasionally I do television commercials and uh, this one is for Dodge. I'm hoping that when I click to the next frame that the commercial will actually play. Let's see. So, what do you think? Don't take this wrong, but it doesn't make me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. Right. Yeah, I find it dark and disturbing. I mean, it's, it's neither cuddly nor waddly. Okay. Binky, any thoughts? That scares the f out of me. Perfect. That's just the reaction we were looking for. The all-new Dodge Caliber. It's anything but cute. <laughs> that was a fun commercial. Um... I, the most recent thing to come out uh, that I worked on is called The Little Prince. It's a movie, a small movie that, um, that actually came out of France, not surprisingly. Um, and it's, uh, if you know the original story, it is not exactly that, but it is in fact another story built around that story. And the director very cleverly created a film whereby we learn the story of uh, what happened to the aviator from the original story when he became an old man and he meets this girl and he tries to tell her the story of the little prince. So whenever he goes back to telling her the story, it reverts to a kind of a, a different style, uh, stop motion. Unfortunately, I didn't get to design those characters, but I did design the, the real world characters, he and the girl and, uh, and others. So I have, uh, I have the trailer for that, hopefully. Little Prince. So, what happens now? Press play. You're gonna be a the, the really cool thing about this movie is it takes place in total blackness. This logo is my favorite character. The fern, the funny fern. And then, 
and then there's music. And that's, you know, it's great. I really urge you to take your friends and family to see this wonderful, wonderful film. The year, the year of your life? Let's put us out of our misery, shall we? Does this ever happen to you? Where you're looking at a thing and it's got a face? <laughs> this is my world. And, uh, and it's, it sort of bolsters my contention that drawing is about hallucination and that we see faces everywhere. And we're always trying to make sense out of the chaos and kind of arrange it. So I'm constantly seeing faces in things. And if I were smart, I would design characters based on those things. I don't usually, but I do try to stay attuned to that because when you are drawing, you are kind of hallucinating and you are finding things, unexpected things in the scribbles. And I think as an artist, that's what you have to allow yourself to do. Which is why it's great to draw when you're really, really tired or drunk. I'm kidding. Um, you see, when you're going to leave here, you're going to see faces everywhere. This was weird. I was leaving a friend's house and I just looked over my shoulder. There are two of them. That was weird. Yeah, right? Right? Anyway, it's a perfect segue. That's not how I came up with the character, but it is a good segue to talk about my work on Ice Age. Um, this has been an amazing journey for me. It's five movies long now. I've designed all the characters for it. And uh, that started about 15 years ago, I think. So I'm going to show you uh, a speedy version of the process of, uh, of how I might come up with a character. Um, the evolution of Sid. Um, start with a blank piece of paper. That is uh, not on purpose. I don't know why there's a blank screen there. So I'm going to go to the next one where there's a picture. Um, uh, Sid was a, a supposedly a, a ground sloth, one of the big prehistoric kind of bear-like creatures. So that's what they look like in the Museum of Natural History. And so I did a lot of designs like that. And when you're working as a character designer, you're showing the director drawings, and hopefully something will hit. Um, just lots of, lots of different ideas. I started to get a sense of how he would move and what his silhouette might be. And then one day I did this drawing. There's all these characters on one page. And the director pointed to the third guy over, who looks familiar, I think. And he said, that guy. I really like that guy. And, and it just reminded me, and I keep it in mind, that the little, sometimes a little doodle can have the answers that you're looking for. And uh, in this case, we worked on the character for another 12 months. And we kept going back to this little sketch to, uh, to keep us on model. I suggested some different patterns, which were rejected. But finally got a real sense of who this guy was and how he would move. That's what a real sloth looks like. And this is what Sid looks like. Now, what you have to take, keep in mind for an animated film, when a CG film like this, every single thing is discussed. I have 10 minutes left. Does that mean I have 10 minutes to talk or 10 minutes to, to have questions? I have 12 minutes altogether. I'm going to leave five minutes to chat with you guys if you have any questions. So I'm going to go quick. Oh, my god. Look at all the. Anyway, you have to, um, you have to discuss everything. The texture of the lips, the direction of the hair, the, the thickness of the hair, the, the, the quality of it. Nothing comes for free in animation. It's all all considered. This was supposed to be a delightful little animated thing here which you're not going to see because it didn't work. <laughs> that dissolve again. Um, these are the kind of instructions I might put on, uh, on a model. Um, these are the kind of details we go into. And this is the scrat. 
this, this, this one here is a very, very early design. It's one of the first. And then I will do drawings to show him in action and get a real sense of who he is and how he moves. And uh, I'll even do, and this, this kind of in-depth thing isn't usually, the character designer isn't usually invited to go this far down the pipeline, but um, I, for, for, for this film and all these films, I've been able to kind of babysit the characters through the whole process. So even, even as much as um, suggesting what the expressions of the character might look like. This was a hilarious short, which you're not going to see. Um, okay, so the poster. So uh, I was asked to do the poster, and, um, and the theme was, I cannot live without books. So immediately I thought, a bookworm cannot live without books. Um, but I, um, I ended up passing that one by, because my friend suggested the exact same thing, and that's usually a bad sign. Um, and then I thought about the way people read and the different positions that they take. And then I thought about my daughters. This is Paulina, and my, uh, she's 15, and Fia is my 10-year-old. And they are both, thank goodness, voracious readers. They put me to shame. It's incredible. But they, their favorite pastime, no joke, is to sit down with a book. And they'll read everywhere and with whomever is around, as Henry Biscuit again. Um, even when they're walking around, dangerously navigating with a book, or a Kindle, in this case. They read until they're exhausted. They read and read and read. She's asleep there. That's Fia. Fia is really the subject of this poster. Um, and in all kinds of positions. It's bizarre, really. <laughs> Unposed. It was that one that made me think. <clears throat> so, um, so this is the sketch that I suggested to the Library of Congress, um, which happily they accepted. Um, you worry about everything. Like animation, you worry about every element in your picture, including the design of the chair. And I thought, oh, I'm going to make it a little bit more modern. But it really wasn't as warm as the as the curved thing. It just didn't suit the, the poses of the character. Um, but I did, I did agonize over it. And then I, um, I started with a blank piece of paper again. <laughs> <sighs> and that's what I made, the poster. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks. How many minutes do we have? We have nine minutes. I bet you don't have nine minutes worth of questions, but I'm going to ask. Does anybody have a question? Yes, sir. I have a question about New Yorker covers. Okay, New Yorker covers. What guidance do you get? How much time do you have? How does that work? They all seem so contemporaneous. Yeah, yeah, but uh, some of them sit around. Well, I should say the, the question is, what's the process for doing a New Yorker cover and how much guideline do I have? And um, for me, there have been a couple of times where I've been offered, hey, what about this idea uh, fully formed? In a, and I, I, I hate that, really, because the New Yorker is, is one of the only places, if one of truly the only places you can get published and publish your idea complete unto itself, unmolested by type and having nothing to do really with the contents of the magazine and just the image stands on its own. So it's really a thrill to be able to sell an idea to the New Yorker. And it's really important to me that the idea be my own. So um, I will, I will um, uh, offer a bunch of sketches on general ideas um, about the seasons, about um, sometimes about politics. I'm really not that, um, I'm not that newsy about it. I like, in fact, I really like my work to seem as timeless as possible. I don't want you to be able to tell me exactly when it was published. Um, but I will do a couple of sketches. Or I'll, I, actually, if I like an idea, I'll only send one version of that sketch. Um, and sometimes the art director says, oh, great sketch. Go ahead with the finish. Other times, she may have a suggestion. And in that case, I have to 
take that in and ask myself, does that help it? Does, does it change it completely? And more than a couple of times, it changed it completely, so much so that I didn't recognize my idea anymore and therefore just couldn't get behind it. So I'll, I'll walk away. Or I'll fight for the other idea and sometimes win. So it's, um, it's, uh, it's, does that answer your question? Does she ask you to do a cover or do you just submit it? She will sometimes, uh, she'll say, got any ideas? basically, and, uh, but sometimes she'll send a note to uh, her, her stable, I don't know how many of us are in that stable, and say, uh, the stock market just crashed. Any ideas? Because we need one by Wednesday. Other times I'll do a drawing that will sit in the bank, literally I had one sit in the bank for like eight years, and then it was published. <sighs> um, yes? Oh, that's, a, that's an interesting idea. She's asking about the uh, New Yorker uh, cartoon caption contest. Now, I should, I should uh, tell you that, that, in fact, cartoonists and illustrators are slightly different species, uh, subspecies of the same thing. And, and I'm more an illustrator. I, my images tend to be more kind of fully blown and rendered, and they rarely, they, don't, they never have a caption. Um, it's, it's two different ways of thinking. Um, so uh, as for your second question, they, they have a, a caption contest whereby they have a cartoon and they ask the reader to supply a caption. Your question is, have they ever thought about supplying a caption and have the readers do the drawings? Uh, I don't know, but I'm going to steal that idea and make a lot of money from it. Um, yes. Thank you. Uh, we're talking about Ice Age. Go ahead. Uh, the question is basically how I came up with Scrat. Also, they started dating during the second movie, right? Okay. Um, uh, Actually, the Scrat, uh, it's funny because the Scrat was not in the original script, and somewhere along the line, uh, they got this idea for the beginning of the movie where this little rodent would try to bury his acorn and start this whole cataclysm. But it was, uh, we were well in when that, when that happened. Uh, so they came to me and they said, quick, we need this quick character, and I did some drawings. The director said, oh, that one, and then it went down the pipeline, but it was really sort of, we didn't fret over it, it just kind of went through. The main characters, you fret and you agonize and you bite your nails and you spend way too much time. But this was kind of a background character. The sequence was supposed to be the prologue of the movie and he gets squashed and that's it, you don't see him again. But they ended up using that sequence because it was the first one they animated and they used it as a, uh, a trailer, a wordless trailer, just a film unto itself and it, nobody would seen anything like it before, a trailer like this, and everybody loved it. Everybody wanted to see that movie with the Scrat in it, and they realized, we better get the Scrat in the movie. So they, if you look at the film, he really doesn't interact with the characters, but for one scene, he's, his story happens parallel and is kind of woven throughout it, which was another accidental boon, because uh, they've used that motif through all the films and he still remains the most popular character, I think. Yes, sir. Oh, I have five minutes. Uh, there's a young lady over there on the trying to get your attention. Thanks, man. <laughs> Hello, young lady. A question. That's a great question. When, when I see something I like, how do I remember it? Uh, you know, uh, that's a really good question. I, I, I see stuff all the time, and I try desperately to remember it. And, and if I don't have a sketch bag, I'm in, uh, a sketch pad, I'm, I'm kind of in trouble. Sometimes I'll take a picture of it. I try to rely on my memory, but often I forget it. I forget it. 
I wish I had a better memory because every day, everywhere I go, I see people, I see costumes, I see expressions, I see animals, I see, I see moments and events and things that I wish I could remember. So it's probably a good idea to carry a little sketch pad with you for that very reason. It's a good question. Thanks. Yes. How do my daughters feel about subjects in my illustrations and are either of them interested in drawing? Um, my daughters don't know I use them in my drawings. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Shh. Um, I, you know what? I think dad making pictures and doing animated films is just like, that's what dads do. You know, that's what they see. Um, and they do like to, they do like to draw. They like to, uh, uh, that's another thing. They'll kind of do as, as entertainment, which is wonderful. I don't think they, um, two minutes left. Okay. Um, I don't know if either of them are going to be angling for a career in it, but they see the drawing as just part of the day and, and it's part of their day, so it's nice. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, what am I working on now, and do I get a chance to talk with other illustrators and things like that? Um, illustrating, first answer is I've been working on a big movie with DreamWorks called Larrikins, and it takes place in Australia. It's, um, I just finished my work on that, but it should be out in a, two years, two or three years. These things take a long time. And do I have dialogue with other illustrators, you ask? Well, it's interesting because because for, uh, to a large extent, I mean, I have friends who are illustrators, but to a large extent, the conversations died down um, a while ago. You know, everybody got into their lives, and illustration is a solitary business. You're home in your studio, and uh, you work alone for the most part, unless you're working on an animated film. But, um, but recently, I reconnected with, with four friends, um, a couple of new ones, and um, we, we went on this three-day museum crawl and spent the entire time talking about art and exchanging ideas and completely just putting ourselves out there, anxieties, aspirations, all this, all of us kind of at the same place. And it's been incredibly energizing and, uh, and inspiring to, to have those conversations. So I'm really happy to be able to say yes, and I'm, I've, I've got the wrap it up sign here, I, there's one person I, you, yes, this is my last question. I'm sorry, a little louder, my hearing's terrible. My best advice for aspiring illustrators, boy, that's a toughie, that's a toughie. I mean, in terms of career, I, I'm not sure, but the work, just drawing and drawing and drawing and, and exploring, and I say that because I was not a big explorer when I was starting out. And I, looking back on it, I wish I had been. You're young, you're starting out, make your mistakes, go into the woods, find things. Allow yourself to do that. That's my best advice. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.